All right. Well, I have a little bit of a cheat sheet tonight. So, uh, Randy, you want to pass those out over here? And Wayne, you want to pass those out over here? It's all the same, so just get one of them. And there's plenty for everybody. You don't have to share one with a spouse. <clears throat> we'll use it a little bit, but perhaps it'll be helpful for you. Just um, a few weeks ago, I started sharing with you my home vacation pictures and a few pictures from the Internet. When I didn't have one that was worthy from my own trip, then I grabbed one off the Internet to show you. Just uh, getting a little bit of highlight from pictures and travel and description of geography and culture and various things to help us connect with the Scripture and maybe get a little bit better visualization of what it was like. Uh, as I've visited with different ones, I've found several of you have been to Israel before. I know that Clifford has been, Wayne's been, Kelly's been, maybe some others. I'm not sure if others have, Randy's been. So what I'm showing you are memories and perhaps connecting some of the dots. Unless you've been several times, there is so much to see and so many of these places at, as archaeological sites look the same. So it's kind of hard to remember, well, where did I see that rock and where did I see that rock? So after you've gone two or three or four times, it all starts to come together a little bit better in your mind and your connection between what you're seeing with what's in the Scripture. So anyway, um, go, here's the first slide. Learnings from Israel, part three, the Sea of Galilee you can tell that I'm not going in any kind of order. We started with Caesarea Philippi, and then, let's see, we went to Capernaum for a couple of weeks, and now we're just kind of looking at the Sea of Galilee. And, but it's, it's really fascinating, and it's, when you see it, it just, all kinds of things come alive for you. So I'm going to help you see it. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide there, Kim, if you would. This is just a, a map of Israel, so we've, we've seen it. And I know from where you are, you can't see everything, but you can see the important part. If you need to back up, that's quite all right. One of the few times in church life when the preacher says, well, just move to the back row. You know, we always say, well, move up. Well, or out on the sides, you can see around Vacation Bible School. This is all Vacation Bible School. If you're not working in VBS, well, why not? Okay. So you can see where we're looking at. That says Lake Tiberias. That's one of the names that it goes by, but there's the Sea of Galilee, and that's where our focus, our attention is today. I have a little bit bigger map tonight than what I've had the last couple of times, so you can get a perspective on the whole thing. There's the Dead Sea, which you're familiar with. Here's Jerusalem and Bethlehem. There's Nazareth. These are all city names that you know. And this is a modern map of Israel. By the way, that's I-S-R-A, the little thing that looks like a T. That's kind of the vowel, I-S-R-A-E-L, Israel. And it reads from right to left. So you can see Syria over here. That's the country of Syria. Here's the country of Lebanon. When we looked at a picture of uh, Caesarea Philippi, we were way up here in this point. This little point that goes up in here, that's where Caesarea Philippi was. And when we looked at some pictures of um, Capernaum, of course, we were right here. We'll see some other places, maps that will show us that. So just some references. Here is the Golan Heights that you've heard so much about whenever you hear anything about the wars that have happened in Israel. You always hear about the Golan Heights. And you also always hear about the West Bank. This little area here that's kind of shaded is all called the West Bank, and that's the area that's under various degrees of Palestinian control. And Jordan is over here on this side as well. Jordan and Israel have a peace agreement. Syria, Lebanon, and, and Israel do not. All right, so let's go to the next slide. There we go. Just a couple of other views. This is uh, from a NASA picture. 
Now you can see the Sea of Galilee here. And I don't know exactly what all the pictures represent. I mean, the colors probably uh, foliage, but not necessarily so. This is the Jezreel Valley that you see sort of a darkened color. This is Mount Carmel where Elijah is going to be. It's a mountain range. So this is the story of Elijah it takes place there. You can see there's Nazareth. Here's Tiberias, the town of Tiberias. Jordan River cutting down through the valley right there. So go ahead, next picture. Uh, that's just another satellite photograph. But it sort of is getting closer in. You can see right here is the, a town. This is Tiberias, the modern city of Tiberias. When, when Jesus lived, Tiberias was not a place that a good Jewish person would want to go to. It was, used, it was kind of the headquarters of, uh, of Roman control in the area and would have been more of a pagan city than a Jewish city. So Jesus very likely never visited Tiberias. By the 3rd and 4th century, it had become heavily Jewish-controlled, um, and it became a, a center of scholar of Jewish scholars, rabbis came and did their studies and things like the, the Masoretic text was developed there and lots of other things. So it became a Jewish center, but it was not at the time of Jesus. So this is the modern town of Tiberias. Most of the things that you know happened around this area right up here. And you can just barely see it, but there's the Jordan River snaking up its way right through here. So Capernaum's going to be on this side. And we'll see another map that's got some names associated with it. I just thought that was an interesting picture. Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead. Go to the next one, Kim. <clears throat> okay, so now it's got a different name there. If you, if you look at the uh, paper that, uh, that we passed out, it, it says the Seal of Galilee. That's a misprint. That's supposed to be the Sea of Galilee, not the Seal of Galilee. Not a seal that goes whoop, whoop, whoop and plays with a ball on its nose or a seal like the way that you seal a letter or something. <clears throat> but the, this, the lake went by many different names. Many of these are used in the Bible. Now, I just put some examples. The Sea of Galilee in Matthew four eighteen, The Lake Tiberius. So the lake changes names according to the most prominent town. And at that point, Tiberius was the most prominent. And Luke, uh, John, excuse me, uh, makes reference to Lake Tiberius, the same lake, of course. And one of those examples is in 6.1. Luke uses Gennesaret as the name of the lake. And that was one of the, one of the names that was used for. You can find it in Luke 5.1. Or Kinnereth or Chinnereth. Uh, Kinnereth or Chinnereth, depending upon which version you're using, an example of that can be found in, Jos in Joshua 13, 27. And the lake of Gennesar. There's that word, Gennesar. That's spelled a little differently than what I did. So Gennesar is an area, well, right there. Right there it is. And we'll see some activities that took place. Um, but a couple of things I wanted to point out for you to look at and be able to position in your mind before we look at some other pictures you see this says mount arbel right here or arbel i'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute but this is just located a little bit north of this town of tiberius mount arbel and just a little bit past that is magdala so mary of magdalene comes from that town uh, magdala has the ruins of the only intact, not the whole thing is there, but all the foundation of, of a synagogue from the first century. And nothing was built on top of it. So it's in very good, a very good state, even though it's just the ruins, it's in a very good condition. So there's Magdala, Gennesar, which doesn't figure a whole lot in Scripture, but um, various names of that. But Capernaum, right around just a little bit further. Bethesda. Bethesda is a disputed location. There's still arguments going on as to whether it was here or whether it was someplace over there. But most scholars have now pretty much agreed this about right in there. And then, of course, here's where the Jordan River comes out on the south side of the, of the lake of the Sea of Galilee. 
But mostly I just want you to keep this order in mind, Mount Arbel, Magdala, Capernaum, something like that. All right, go to the next picture. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you some pictures of these places. I just have a little correction to make on the map. You, you know, you can't completely trust the Internet. So don't always believe everything you find there. But for the most part, you can kind of believe. So here's uh, Tiberius. So you're familiar with that now. And there's Magdala. This says the multiplication of the loaves and fishes and then the church of primacy. In, in real life, that church is over here and the multiplication is over there. They got them backwards. And so here's the Mount of the Beatitudes and here's Capernaum. And I'm going to show you some pictures that will show you where those are. Okay, let's see. One more. All right. So back to your paper for just a minute. The Sea of Galilee. Uh, some geographical, mostly geographical details. One of them is a fish detail, not a geographical, but... I've mentioned before, and you, you already know, that this lake is 13 miles from north to south, and it's 8 miles from east to west, or west to east, or east to west. You can go either way. It's the same distance, whichever one you want to do. At its deepest point, it's about 141 feet deep. So it's not terribly deep, but that's, that's pretty good for a lake. Uh, I say it's about because sometimes... If it's a rainy season, well, it's deeper. And if it's a dry season, it's not quite that deep. But an interesting fact is you can't really feel it when you're there, but it is 700 feet, approximately 700 feet below sea level to the surface of the sea. So it is the, the lowest um, elevation of any freshwater lake in the whole world at 700 feet below sea level. Of course, the Dead Sea is much lower than that, but the Dead Sea is, is salt or various kinds of salts that comprise its water. It's located on the Jordan Rift Valley, which is part of the Great Rift Valley that goes from Lebanon all the way down to Mozambique, about 4,300 miles in length. So a rift valley is where two tectonic plates come together and one folds underneath the other. So this whole pattern that you've seen um, in these maps where you've got um, the Sea of Galilee and then you've got the Jordan River and then you've got the Dead Sea and that's all down that Rift Valley and that runs down to the Red Sea and all the way down into Africa, like we said, all the way down into Mozambique. So it is a major uh, uh, tectonic plate merging spot. And that's what creates that very unique geography. Um, okay, and then just final, there's a whole lot of different kinds of fish that live in this, in this lake. Freshwater fish from catfish, which our good Jewish friends don't eat, to tilapia, which is a really good fish, and lots of us like to eat that. So there's a couple of little points. All right, let's take a look at the, here we go, that one right there. So one of the things that tourists like to do is to take a boat ride out on the Sea of Galilee. It's really revelatory in that you get out in the middle of that thing and the boat stops. You really do have a clear perspective as to how small that, that lake is. Our imagination from childhood in Sunday school was that this was a massive body of water. And until you get out in the middle of it and you can see, well, there's the west coast and there's the east coast and there's the north coast, you never really do get a good perspective until you're kind of in that spot. Those of you who have been there before can attest to, to what I am saying. It really does kind of open your mind to sometimes you read stories about how they went from one place and they went to someplace else and thousands of people chased them over there and they got there almost as quickly as they did. And how did that happen? Because it was only a couple of miles. So they were <laughs> chased and they could see them out there. On a clear day, you can see everything that's out there in that, in that body of water. So people like to take these boat rides. This is looking toward the east. This would be the Golan Heights on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. All right, go ahead. This is the boat that we took. We took Noah. So I guess, you know, that, that's my grandson's name, so it seemed to be a good, a good portent. You know, it was telling us good things are going to happen. Go ahead. 
And we started out from that Genesar. That, did I say that right? Genesar. There is now a kibbutz. And a kibbutz was sort of a Jewish communal living place. Uh, early on, they were mostly agricultural kibbutz. People would come together so that they could uh, grow different kinds of products. And a lot of them have now become rather commercial establishments. But this boat launched from Genesar. And when we pushed off from shore, they played the national anthem. So we all put our hands on our hearts and we sang along. It was great. Uh, these are all people that came from Troy. There's Troy Knight. These all came from his church in North Carolina. All right, go ahead. So we get out into the sea, and I turned and looked back toward the west. This is Tiberias, the modern town of Tiberias, how it goes up the side of the hill. It's bigger than that, but you can kind of get a bit of a view of what the modern town of Tiberias looks like. All right, next one. So I told you to remember where Mount, the Mount Arbel was on the map. So there was Tiberias, and you come just a little bit toward the north, and then you see this spot. So there's a couple of boats that are sitting out there on, on the lake, and, but looking back toward the west, you see a very pronounced cliff and a valley and cliffs on the other side. This was the walking trail that in the time of Jesus people would have taken to go toward the west, whether they were going towards uh, Haifa, that area where there were ports, or if they were going to join with the major trade routes that went through the Jezreel Valley and crossed over over onto the coast. This was the major way that people would walk back and forth. There were a number of very important battles that took place in this kind of area during the Hasmonean period. There were lots of bandits that hung out in the caves that are up on the cliffs and things of that sort. But the major point that I want to make to you is this particular structure, geographical structure, plays heavily into the storms that can occur on the Sea of Galilee. All the way, just about all the way around the Sea of Galilee, there are hills, mountains. They're not mountains like the Rocky Mountains, but they're, they're great protrusions up. On the eastern side, we saw, I told you about the Golan Heights. Those go all the way down the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. On the western side, there, there are these foothills. There's like you saw at Tiberias. Just a little bit north of Tiberias, there's a bit of a flat plain there that goes up toward the northern side. But this structure, this geological structure there, whenever the conditions are right, this bowl that's 700 feet below sea level can have great atmospheric and temperature differences on the different sides of the lake. And that sets up gusty wind that cuts down through this pass right here and churns the Sea of Galilee up very quickly into a, quite a tempest. So all those stories we read about how the Sea of Galilee became a storm all of a sudden and they were trying to keep from being sunk and here comes Jesus walking on the water and this is what causes that to happen is this very structure right here. That's the way they described it to us. I passed on to you what the guides passed on to us. But we can see how that happens quite easily. All right, go ahead. So now we've moved a little bit. There was Tiberias, then here was the Mount Arbel, and then we went a little bit further towards the north. And here is, um, this is, uh, let me see. Uh, I always have to think to make sure I get the structure, the, the sequence right. This is the, um, the place of the multiplication of the fish. This is a traditional place of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. So go ahead to the next slide. If you go there today, you'll find a church that's built to memorialize that spot. We don't know for sure that that's where it happened, but it's a traditional spot. But it's been identified as the spot for that event since the third century. And what you see here, there, there, were, there was a church built excuse me, in the 4th century, 340, 350, a church was built there. And that church was expanded in the 5th century. And when they expanded the church, they built, they, they put on the floor a mosaic 
of loaves and fishes. Well, over time, it became neglected, and for like 1,300 years, nobody even remembered this location. And in the 1800s, it was purchased by the Franciscans and excavated, and when they did, they found this mosaic that was on the floor of the 5th century church. That doesn't, that doesn't say absolutely this is where it happened, but it does say that the tradition is very, very old. It's a very, very old tradition. So that mosaic that you see is from the 5th century. You can't step on it today, but you can get pretty close to it and take a picture. And so I did. All right, go ahead. And so just a little bit further to the north is this little place that's right there. It's called the Primacy of Peter or Mensa Christi. Isn't that exciting? Go to the next picture. So inside the little church that's built there, there is this rock. And the tradition is that when Jesus and the disciples, after, after his resurrection, they go back to fish on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus comes up there, and they're, they're fishing, and they haven't caught anything, and, you know, throw it on the other side, and a whole bunch of fish. And then they recognize Jesus. And when they get to the shore, he's cooked some fish, and they, there's a rock there that's described in Scripture. They, they, were, they were sitting on a rock or something. I don't remember the exact words, but... so. The legend or the tradition is that this is the rock. So mensa means table. So this was the table of Christ. This too has a pretty old tradition that it was the spot. So it may or may not have been. But we know that it was in that region, in that area. All right, go ahead. Home slides. So uh, both the primacy of, of Peter and... The uh, multiplication of the loaves and fishes are in that little spot right in there. Tabga. Tabga. Not an easy word to say. Uh, I've never been to the Cove of the Sower, so I don't know exactly what is there. But just a little bit up the hill is the Mount of the Beatitudes, which is right here. And then here's the entrance to Capernaum. So that one you've seen before. All right, so go ahead to the next picture. Now you can see them all. So here is the multiplication of the fishes. Here's the primacy of Peter. And there's the Mount of the Beatitudes. Just a little bit to the west of the Mount of the Beatitudes, there is a natural valley that cuts right up through here. And nobody can prove that that's where the Sermon on the Mount took place. But many people have tested the natural acoustics of this little valley. And you can look it up. You'll find it online. Our guide told us the same thing. In this little valley, a person who gets up in this spot and speaks, everything they say can be heard all the way down the valley. So how in the world did all those thousands of people get there and hear what he said? There's a natural phenomenon that amplifies the voice or carries the voice. All right, go ahead. So here's the Sea of Galilee. This kind of give you a little bit of a quick around, around the sea view. This is, a, this is a video. And we're at our hotel. We're at the hotel, and we're just kind of taking a little quick span. So let it roll, if it will play. Huh? It played a while ago. It's worth seeing. <laughs> Sometimes if you just click down to the next slide, it, it will automatically play. Yes, no, what do you think, Kim? Going to re reboot for a second? It did work a while ago, didn't it? Yeah. That's the Rose of Sharon. <laughs> I don't know what it 
the lily of the valley. <laughs> That's technology. And yes. All right. Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee. That's looking to the east. That's our hotel. The land of rascals. The land of rascals. And there's Todd, there's Chara, there's Irma. <laughs> they were the rascals. I got you. So that's looking south. That's looking over towards the country of Jordan as it panned around. It was looking at the, at the east and then the north and scanned all the way around. But you could, you could see all the way around the lake from where we were on the western side. Now let's, let's try the next one, see if that one will work too, Kim. This one's from out in the middle of the lake. There it is. There's the Arbel Mountains. You see the cliffs? Going past Magdala, going past Genesar. Right in that little tree area is Pagba. You can't see Capernaum because the boat's in the way. That's going to be the Goland Heights that you see on the far eastern side. back to the, the Arbel Mountain. So, you know, that was a quick pan all the way around the Sea of Galilee. All right, let's see. Maybe we can get to the next one. We're just about done. So the place where we got on that boat that took us out into the middle of the Sea of Galilee is at this kibbutz, Genesar kibbutz. And when we came back, we went into a museum and took a look at this boat. So this boat is from the first century. On a particular year when the water level of the lake was very, very low, a couple of brothers were out just kind of uh, forging around in the mud and the dirt, and they found a couple of nails, and they dug down a little bit, and they found some wood. And they dug a little bit further, and they recognized that they had found a boat. They also found that if that, the wood of the boat was exposed to the air, it would crumble. And so they got professional help that came in, and they, they excavated the boat, and they covered it completely with some kind of neoprene, foam, something. And the fascinating thing is that they excavated and completely covered it in this protective foam, and then it popped up in the water and it floated off <laughs> after 2,000 years this boat floated it took them seven years of treating the wood to get it where it would not deteriorate in the air and so you're looking at a fishing boat that's from the first century it's kind of hard to get a perspective on how large it is it's not very large I think it's 18 20 22 feet something like that from one side to the other you can see a person standing off to the side Go to the next slide. It has another little picture looking straight on. You can clearly tell it's a boat. Wooden, it was made out of something like 20 different species of wood. Um, and one more slide. This is probably what it looked like before it, it had been buried underwater for 2,000 years. So it's not terribly big, but you can imagine that you could put 12 people in there or more and sail across the sea. So it was in a boat very similar to that, that these guys fished and that Jesus slept and that he walked on the water until he got to it. So just a couple of things. We won't have time to read through these, but I gave you some passages that just give little snippets of the, the Sea of Galilee and the importance of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. 
but he was rejected at Nazareth. And right after that, in Luke chapter 4, verse 31, it says he moved to Capernaum. And Capernaum now becomes his headquarters. Capernaum's right on the Sea of Galilee. In Luke 5, 1 through 11, Jesus called his first disciples while he and they were on the Sea of Galilee, probably very close to Capernaum. We don't know exactly where, but that's the most logical spot that these guys would have been fishermen and they would have fished out of their home port, which was Capernaum. If you jump over to Matthew chapter 5, that is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It doesn't tell exactly where he was, but it, on, in chapter 5, verse 1, he went up on the mountain and the people came to him, his disciples came to him, and he taught them. And when you get to the end of it, at the end of chapter 7, as soon as you get into chapter 8, by 8, verse 5, the end of the sermon indicates that the Sermon of the Mount was preached just north of the Sea of Galilee because in 8.5 it says he was at Capernaum. So it's just a logical construction that this is where it took place. Was it right there where I showed you the little valley and the, the church that's on that spot? We don't know, but a lot of evidence points to it being there or very close to there. In Matthew 14, this is just an example of Jesus and the, and the sea. The feeding of the 5,000 likely took place just north of the Sea of Galilee. Did it happen where that church is? Maybe. Maybe, maybe it did. It's memorialized today at Tagba in the Church of the Multiplication of the Loaves and Fishes. But right after that, 14, 13 through 21, if you look the next one in letter E, Matthew 14, 22 through 33, that's where Jesus walks on the water. And uh, that's recorded in Matthew and in Mark and in John. It's one of the few things that's in John that's also in all of the, that's in the Synoptic Gospels as well. And then finally, I pointed this out in the pictures in John 21, 1 through 14, Jesus met his disciples after the resurrection and the reinstitution, the reinstituting of Peter, and that's memorialized near Tagba at the church of the primacy of Peter. Now, we don't recognize Peter in his primacy. We don't say, well, he was the first pope. They do, and they, they recognize that church, and it's got importance for the Catholics in that manner. But for us, it's just... Here's, here's the, the land, and here are the stories, and there they are, right there, looking at them. It kind of uh, touches you deeply, and maybe vicariously. Touch me, I passed it on to you. So, anyway, the Sea of Galilee. I did not bring any of that water with me. I should have. We could have passed it out and all taken a sip or something. Well, maybe we wouldn't have wanted to do that, but okay. Well, I, I hope this isn't too dull. Uh, I plan to do this for several weeks, and some places will be exciting, and some places won't be quite as exciting, but we'll see some, I think, some very interesting things over time. So come and join us on Wednesdays when you can. Let's have a closing prayer, and then uh, we have choir practice and men's ministry on Saturday. Hope you'll be able to join us for that. And after the men's ministry, if there's a few of you that can help us over at the encampment, we've got a project there we're working on that's got to get completed. And uh, Rob Smith has been going over there regularly and working on it. If there are others of us who might can help him on Saturday, that would be, that would be a great thing. If you want more information about that, I'll be glad to tell you. Let's have a prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. That did not happen in a vacuum. These were not myths. These were moments in history. The movements of people, the speaking of words, the changing of lives. And Lord, as my friend says, this land is like the fifth gospel. It tells the stories of Jesus over and over again just by being there. I pray, Lord, that the things that we see and the stories that we tell will somehow help somehow Help the Bible to become alive for us. Help us this week that we may live for Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. Hope to see you men on Saturday. <laughs>